Thank you. Wow, wow. Happy Thanksgiving. Bobby Connor is going to be with us tonight. It's going to be so good. I miss Bobby. I love Bobby and I miss him. I'm so glad. So glad he's going to be here. I was just at Twin View speaking and, and my phone, while I was talking, just came alive and started playing Jeremy Riddle's new album. <laughs> which means more. It's titled More. So I just feel like God is saying, even my phones will cry out. <laughs> my favorite story happened in Brian Nickens' class on the Gospel of John while he was teaching. His phone was off to the side. And it just came on, on its own. And Siri spoke and said, in my realm, anyone can do anything. That's got to grab your attention. We didn't know Siri was a prophetess. Here it comes. She's a part of the apostolic movement. I know, I know. Yeah, the more of them just, just started singing while I was talking. I thought, where's that music coming from? And I went, oh, oops. Oops, I'll turn it off, turn it off. Right. I have some blonde jokes again. You know, I know it's not correct. I, just forgive me ahead of time. But just to keep it even, these are blonde men jokes. So, so, so all of the blonde men, I'm sorry, just pretend it's gray-haired men, all right? A friend told a blonde man, Christmas is on Friday this year. The blonde man then said, let's hope it's not the 13th. Two blonde men find three grenades and they decide to take them to the police station. One asked, what if one explodes before we get there? The other one said, we'll lie and tell them we only found two. <laughs> blonde man is in the bathroom. His wife shouts, did you find the shampoo? He answers, yes, but I'm not sure what to do. It's for dry hair and I've already got my hair wet. A blonde man sees a letter laying on his doormat. On the envelope, it says, do not bend. He spends the next two hours trying to figure out how to pick it up. <laughs> uh, sorry, it's not over yet. You have, to endure, you have to endure pain just a little bit longer. A blonde man shouts frantically on the phone to his doctor. Says, my wife is pregnant. Her contractions are only two minutes apart. The doctor asks, is this her first child? No, he shouts, this is her husband. <laughs> Blonde man is driving home, he's drunk as can be. Suddenly has to swerve to avoid a tree, then another and then another. The cop car pulls him over tells the cop about all the trees in the road. The cop says, that's your air freshener swinging on your mirror. <laughs> There's just three more, then the pain will be over. Blonde man's dog goes missing. He's frantic. His wife says, why don't you put an ad in the paper? He does, but two weeks later, the dog's still missing. She says, what'd you put in the paper? He said, here, boy, here, boy. <laughs> Just two more, two more, then it's over. Blonde man's in jail. The guard looks in his cell, sees him hanging by his feet. He says, what are you doing? He says, I'm hanging myself. The guard says, it should be around your neck. He said, I tried that, but then I couldn't breathe. A 
I hope you're enjoying this because I'm using valuable sermon time for this. One more, one more. An Italian tourist. <laughs> this is the true story. I was in Germany and I, and I, I shared this joke and my translator started laughing so hard. I just, I lost him. I, 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 he, he was so overcome with laughter that uh, he kept repeating in his head the, the joke. I think it was the one about uh, um, scientists have found that women who add a few extra pounds live longer than the men who mention it. <laughs> it, it, it he just lost it. It was hard, hard to get a good translation out of him after, the, after that point. All right, one last one. Italian tourists ask a blonde man, why do scuba divers always fall backwards off their boats? To which the blonde man replies, if they fell forward, they'd still be in their boats. <laughs> I'm sorry, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're very kind. All right, let's get going. We've got, we've got 30 minutes to go. Um, I want you to go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. <clears throat> One of the most significant truths to really be embraced and taught on in the last 20 plus years has been the whole concept of impartation. It's, it's just such a rich truth because there can be a grace, an anointing, a gifting on one person's life and they can pray for someone else and they actually start functioning in that area. But what's kind of humorous to me, I, you, just forgive me for my sense of humor again, but it, what's kind of humorous to me is oftentimes people will come and ask for prayer for something that is actually a mark of maturity. You can't get through maturity through impartation. If only that were true, man, we could just line up and be like Paul tomorrow, you know. Yeah. Maturity comes from choices, making yeah. decisions. So you can pray for someone, you can be one minute old in Jesus and pray for somebody who has cancer and they can be healed. It didn't come, the gifting didn't come from maturity. Uh, th excuse me, the gifting, yeah, it didn't come from years in Christ. It just came from grace. The maturity comes when you are now faced with decisions. What are you going to do with the fact somebody just got healed through you? Do you think it's your significance? Do you think you are the source of the gift? Do you think you are the source of the faith? How is the story shared? Is it shared with you at the center or Jesus? And all, all we do in those moments is we're, we're allow, the Lord is actually measuring what realm or measure of glory can we live with, can we carry? See, the original target of the Lord for every person was to actually live in the glory of God. And just for simplicity's sake, we'll define the glory as the manifested presence of Jesus. It's the actualized presence of God. And so the scripture says, all have fallen short of the glory of God. So sin means to miss the mark. So sin causes people to miss God's intended target. What was the intended target? The glory of God to live in the manifested presence of Christ. Not just as a point of theology, not just as a point of doctrine, I am in Christ, he is in me, but more than that, an actualized, realized reality that we live from. Where we see the God of scripture appear in unusual ways and rest upon people in unusual ways and manifestations in the temple or tabernacle, that is actually the manifestation that, that is potentially a part of everybody in this life who has a personal relationship with Jesus. So all have sinned and fallen short of the glory, miss the mark. What does salvation do? It restores us to the target. It doesn't restore us halfway to the target so that in heaven we can get the rest. When Jesus said it was enough, he actually meant, I did everything needed to accomplish the original plan. And so Jesus intends to live, uh, is, it lives among us, lives in us, rests upon us. But there are measures of presence that are yet to be discovered that have been discovered in prior generations. This, this isn't the subject today, so I've got to be careful not to get too lost into that. But let, let me just say this. 
His desire is to fully reveal himself, who he is upon his people, fully. But the weightiness of that revelation would crush many people who are following the Lord because there are fractures in their thinking, fractures in their values. It's not that they don't genuinely love Jesus. It's just they have a weakness in their foundation that needs to be revealed gently and carefully so that the Lord can bring healing there. It is true. It is true. The Lord's not afraid of bringing junk up in our life, bringing it to the surface, but he brings it to the surface so it can be dealt with. He never brings it to the surface to shame us or to mock us. He only brings it out so that we will see what he's been seeing all along. What confession is, is we just make agreement with what he already knows to be true. Oh, God, forgive me. I'm so arrogant and proud. He says, yeah, I I knew that. That's not a shock to me. I just allowed you to see it in this situation that you're just very self-centered. So we're going to break that. And what happens, he brings it to the surface so that we can acknowledge it. Because once we deeply confess and repent, he gives us the grace to forsake that which kept us in bondage. All right, back to the subject. So the choices that we have uh, throughout life are where where the, the muscle of integrity, the muscle of character is developed. In, uh, in lifting weights, for example, if you, if you lift a light weight 100 times, it's not going to build muscle. It's when, you build something that, it's when you lift something that really pushes your capacity. And maybe you can only lift that thing three times, but it's the third time that works the most. It's the hardest lift. That's, that's what actually accomplished the most. And when we have difficult situations rise up in our life, it's always for the purpose of building character. It's never to shame. It's never to mock. It's never to intimidate or humiliate. It's always the invitation to come into Christ, into a place of greater strength. That's why in in, uh, um, 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is God's will in Christ Jesus concerning you. Think through this now. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is God's will in Christ concerning you. One of the most overwhelming, or or, uh, I shouldn't say overwhelming, one of the most frequently repeated prayers or requests from this family of believers, especially including our school, is this heart uh, to know God's will for our life. And generally what that is reduced to is, God, do you want me to be a missionary or a veterinarian or a school teacher or a pastor or whatever? We, we want to do what he wants us to do. It's a legitimate prayer. It's a legitimate request. I'm not sure God's as concerned about that as he is about this. This says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will in Christ concerning you. This is the will of God for my life. I remember as a young man, you know, just past, starting to pastor in Weaverville, I was reading through Thessalonians, reading through these verses, and, and these verses just jumped out at me. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. And I, I came face to face with the fact, man, I could only have those three verses, and it would take the rest of my life for me to learn it. I mean, if I had nothing else to read but those three verses, I'd have a full-time job ahead of me because to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing and everything give thanks. It just means you have, you have disciplined responses to levels of difficulty and challenges and opportunities that you face. You have disciplined responses that help to form and to shape the character in us. And remember, it's that, it's, that, it's that character that is able to carry the weightiness of what God is doing in the earth. He's looking for people he can entrust himself to. The whole impartation idea came, I've been thinking for years. I wish if there's one thing I could ask of the Lord to be able to impart to people, it would be a thankful heart. You just don't get it through impartation. You get it through choices. Do you know in, in in Nehemiah, it's kind of a, to me, it's an, it's an awkward uh, part of a story. It's in <clears throat> chapter 11, the end of chapter 11, in all of chapter 12. It has this reoccurring theme. There were people that were assigned to give thanks to God. Uh, what do you do for a living? Oh, I, I, I give thanks. <laughs> I give thanks. Yeah, like, what does that look like? Well, they just give me a list. 
and, uh, and I, I stand before God, and I say thank you, and I, and I mention what we're thankful for. That sounds, that sounds so formal and so, so ritualistic that there's no life in it, and yet there's a secret in that routine. You bypass the limitation of your own emotional condition, and you make mature choices which activate your emotional condition to get into line with what you're doing. See, complaining empowers the inferior to undermine your faith. Complaining only happens when we are more mindful of a problem than we are of God. It's impossible to complain when you're more aware of the goodness of God than you are of a problem. You actually violate. To do that, you'd have to violate your your conscience, your your sense of purpose, your sense of being, the sense of God's presence. You have to violate all of that just to start complaining. I'm glad I've never done that. I I <laughs> says rejoice always. That means like in the original language always actually means always. Just always, just, just, you know, no matter what happened, choose joy. Well, I don't feel like it. That's why it's a choice. Do you think he would have to command it if we did it naturally? The only reason it's a command is because here's a chance for you to flex a muscle. You said you want to grow. You said you want to carry the weightiness of God into the earth. Here's something you can learn to do. Well, what is it? Well, you're going to miss your flight. No, no, not that. Not that. Here, I'm, I'm, I'm taking you deep into my personal life. When I miss a flight, I come up to the gate. Uh, this has happened. I've sat on the tarmac forever because they can't find a place to park my plane. And I look at my clock, I go, my other flight's boarding right now. Boy, am I thankful. Boy, am I feeling rejoicing right now. And I just sit there for a half hour while my plane boards. And we're just sitting there on the tarmac. And then I notice my plane. (laughs) And then the one I'm on finds a place to park. My first response is not rejoicing. And I've got to admit admit to you, it's not my second either. Rejoicing is like way down the list. I've got to experience a few other things first. I've got to explore the emotional tundra before I end up in rejoicing when that happens to me. When somebody passes you on a freeway, no problem. You go as fast as you want. Not a problem for me. Pulls in front of you and then slows down. It's not a big deal. It's just wrong. It's just wrong. Have they no conscience? Where is the conviction of the Spirit of God when we need it? Okay. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Rejoice always is, is choosing joy. It's, it's actually, it, it wouldn't be commanded if it wasn't within the reach of a choice. Joy is, is, is the part of the kingdom. So it's, it's, it's at hand. It is always within reach. I have, I'm a powerful person. I, say this with me. I am a powerful person. Joy is always within reach. Joy is always within reach. Pray without ceasing is kind of like the same as rejoice always. Without ceasing means just always. <laughs> just pray and don't stop. Interestingly, Philippians says, um, Philippians, base, I'll just quote it to you, it's, it, uh, make reference to it. Philippians 4 verse 6 talks about supplications and prayers. That's the earnest getting before the Lord, contending with God for a breakthrough. And he says, with thanksgiving. Why? Thanksgiving creates the context to keep prayer on focus. 
I mean, I know this is a dumb question because all of us would say yes, but how many of you want to have effective prayers? Of course we do. We, want to have a, we don't pray just to, you know, we're not running on a treadmill just trying to cover the miles. We're, we, we want to bring impact. Our heart is to bring change, to see it in our own lives, our families, the world around us. We want to see uh, things take place because we've prayed. Thankfulness is what helps to keep prayers on target. There are times where I'm praying for somebody, ministering to somebody, let's say they're sick. Let's say they have a, a certain problem, or arthritis, let's just say, throughout their arm. And, and I'm praying for them, and nothing's happening, zero breakthrough. And then the Lord will give me an insight of a more precise way to pray. And when I change my prayer from a general prayer of God, heal the arthritis that's in the arm, and I get down to a very specific or precise prayer, then the breakthrough comes. I can't tell you why. But I can tell you this, for me to stand up here and just say, oh, Jesus, please heal everyone in the room today. Amen, we give you thanks. Nothing's gonna happen. Why? Because it's gotta be more precise. And what thankfulness does is it hones the precision of our prayer life because it keeps it about him, because it is that place of dependency, place of acknowledgement. The, the strength in prayer is not that you complain or bellyache about a problem. It's that you've joined your heart with his to see his kingdom come and his purposes worked out in the earth. And thankfulness is what keeps us engaged with precision. Wow. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing in everything, give thanks. I, you know, I don't know that anybody's supposed to give thanks for a bad report from the doctor. That wouldn't be doesn't make any sense to me. But it does make sense to me to remain thankful, to, to keep my list of blessings stronger than my list of needs. How many of you have a, you've ever made a prayer list out? How many of you, if you've not written one, you certainly have one in your mind. I mean, I, I've got them in my iPads. I've got, I've got lists in there of things that I pray for, and, you know, just stuff, stuff that I can, content for. I just get before the Lord God. I, we've got to see breakthrough. We've got to see breakthrough there. And I, I believe in it. But how many of you have thankfulness lists? Probably not as many. There's, there's a few, and it's wonderful. But the, but the point is, is we stay more conscious of need than conscious of blessing. And when I stay more conscious of need than I'm conscious of blessing, I will tend to pray out of a hole instead of from heavenly places. I will stand, I'll tend to pray more out of a place. Desperation is not bad, so I, I, I don't have the best language, so give me a little grace with this. But I will tend to pray out of a place of desperation instead of a place of authority. Thankfulness, thankfulness is what hones that. Take a look at me with uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, excuse me, chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. We're going to read five verses. Verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from foods, which God created to be received with thank, thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Um, look at this again. Verses 1 and 2 gives us warning. I don't know how your Bible reading goes. I, I just want to encourage you. Don't skip over the hard stuff. It's, it's so vital. Here's the difference. There's meat and milk of the word. Are you with me on that analogy? There's meat of the word, there's the milk. Milk comforts, meat provokes change. Meat is called in Hebrews the word of righteousness. So it is the word that equips, enables, and provokes. It cuts to bring about change. And we all want to be comforted, but we've also be, got to be changed through the reading of word, the embracing of what God has said. And sometimes it's just, it's meditating on receiving, dwelling, slowing down in the hard places. He who gains his life will lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake will gain it. Slow down in those passages because it needs to cut deep. It's got to cut deep. If it doesn't cut, 
if it, if it doesn't bring pain, it's not, a, it's not the word of righteousness that brings change. There's got to be that, that point where you go, oh. It's necessary. It, it's, let me illustrate it this way. There are people who have certain kinds of uh, afflictions, difficulties in their body, and perhaps you go to a doctor, and the doctor says, uh, man, you have no feeling in your foot. He says, no. So he takes a sock and shoe off, and he takes a needle, and he'll just prick the bottom of the foot, and there's no pain. See, it's not a good sign to not feel pain. It's not positive. It's actually it's a sign of a problem, is when, is when something should hurt, and it doesn't. You don't ever want to read through this stuff and go, oh yeah, all is well. Not a good sign. Not a good sign. You want that thing to prick. You want to go, oh, that hurts so good. <laughs> but it's, it's, it, it's, that, it's that word that makes you know you're alive. <clears throat> so he talks about those who fall away from the faith. Interestingly, verse 3 says, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from foods which God created to receive with thanks, uh, thanksgiving. Let, let me just stop there. This is kind of a, a, a weird deal. Paul's warning uh, Timothy and, and the group that he leads, he's warning them. He said, listen, um, we know people's hearts are going to grow cold. They're going to become deceived by demons. This, all this junk's going to happen. And out of that group is going to come a list of rules, non-biblical rules. Now remember, the Bible does give us commands and don't ignore them just because you live under grace. Grace doesn't give you a pass to skip the rules. Grace gives you the power to do the rules. So here's a list of rules that's created out of this deceptive movement. And what is it? They are rules that make you more pleasing to God. That's what they say. So in other words, you're going to obtain favor. If you do this, if you don't marry, you don't eat these certain foods, you do this, this, and this. You observe this particular day in Romans, he, he expands the list. He says you, you follow this day instead of this day, you eat this instead of this, you drink this instead of this. These list of rules, if you do everything just right, then you'll have favor with God. What happened to Adam and Eve? The serpent crawled up to him and said, if you partake of this fruit, you'll be like God. They already were. The enemy tried to get them to obtain through works what they already had by grace, which they already had by design. So shifting the focus from what God has done for me that now enables me to, be, to live freely for him, the focus now shifts to what I must do to somehow apprehend and gain God's favor. The focus shifts, and whenever... Whenever that happens, it becomes a flesh-empowered movement, and that was the deception of this movement. Yes, amen. Verse 4. I, I didn't plan this, but having gone hunting this last week, it's just the perfect verse to read. For every creature of God is good. I believe that, right next to the potatoes. I, I'm... <laughs> I, I went on an outreach with my boys this week. We reached out and touched the heart. Harvested protein to sustain a revival is what it is. All right, that's enough. Every creature of God is good, for nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. This is amazing. Here's what he says. Nothing is to be refused. What's the point? Is this not something you bought at the store? What's the implication? What Paul had to deal with, with a group of people, is they would be invited to somebody else's home and they would hear they were being served a food that was either unclean, pork or whatever, or it was actually food that was offered to an idol. And here he's giving him instruction. Don't refuse anything that you would determine is unclean. Why? Because that which is used to be against you becomes sanctified by your own thankfulness. Your thankfulness takes the sting out of what the enemy attempt to destroy you and is now used for your benefit because it is sanctified with prayer and the word of God. Sanctified. 
Sanctified is an interesting word because it means separate, separate from sin, separate from darkness, separated to God. But it doesn't stop there. It actually implies that when I am made holy, when I, as, I am, as I am separated from my own lifestyle to, to the Lord, it, means, it implies I actually become like the one I am separated to. Wow. We should know this just in the natural. Husbands and wives have been married a long time. They start thinking alike. They start acting alike. I mean, there's, there's just this, this, this time of just being together or they, they change because they've been separated from everyone else unto this person and they actually, in many ways, pick up some of their characteristics and natures. Well, this is even more profound in our relationship with Christ because we are separated from a dark world system that is self-serving unto the Lord. We actually, in the relationship, become like the one we're separated to. Now follow that thought. When you are offered something in this case, it was food that would contaminate you. With thankfulness, it enables the word of God and prayer to sanctify that which was released against you and now becomes something that is for you. Um, thankfulness takes the sting out of something sent your way to harm you. <laughs> oh, goodness, I am almost out of time. I'm going to go over a couple minutes because we can afford it on this service, but just a couple minutes. I take it. Thank you. I receive it. Thankfulness I had a uh, friend, acquaintance, in dialogue with this last summer, was writing a book, at least part of the book, against me and against us. And uh, so I wrote him, and I told him I welcome the book. I welcome it. Not because I think it will add to the health of the body of Christ, but because what I want in life is on the other side of facing difficulty well. Navigating betrayal or criticism. You know, you can't be trusted with praise if you don't trust him with criticism. You can't, tr you can't be trusted with gain if you don't trust him in loss. You can't be trusted with loyal friends if you don't trust him in betrayal. And so while I don't think any of these things are designed of the Lord, I'm going to embrace them and learn how to navigate life through those challenging situations. Why? Because of the prayers I've prayed. I prayed the same scary prayers you've prayed. God, I want to see everyone that we come into contact with healed. I want to see everybody saved in our city. God, we want to see nations discipled. These are huge prayers, but they are not released upon careless people because careless people become preoccupied with themselves in the midst of the glory being manifest, the glory being poured out. And so difficulties come our way. What is it? It's just simply an op opportunity to learn how to monitor my heart, to give thanks in all things, rejoice in all things, pray in every situation, absolute dependency on him. Why? This is what we were born for. And what I want is on the other end of adverse winds. And I've got to learn how to use my sail and the rudder, if you will, to tack until I can make the advancements necessary to get me to where I want to go. So I, I, I told him, I said, I, I don't welcome it because I, I think it'll help us, but I do welcome it. You know, he wrote back very kindly and ended up a long, long dialogue that isn't the point of the discussion today, except that he, he openly, openly repented and, and changed that particular part of his book. And uh, it, it's not up for discussion, it's not necessary for today, but the, the point is, is being thankful for things that you think the enemy sent your way, it doesn't mean I'm thankful for the book. I am thankful for the opportunity to grow. I'm thankful that if I learn to navigate this right, he can trust me with more. I don't like it. It's not something I'd volunteer for. But I gave up my rights when I said yes. When I said the big yes, I gave up my right to, to bargain for what kind of circumstances I'm willing to face. And thankfulness is like 
Man, it's like the number one virtue that changes a person's life. And dare I say, the entire nature of a city. I think thankfulness can change the nature of a family line. Yeah. Amen. All right. Happy Thanksgiving. Why don't you stand up? <laughs> I do wish it was something it could be imparted through prayer, though. And I, I think I'd walk all through town just going, receive. Receive. <laughs> Receive. He said, I enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart, courts with praise. A thankful heart remains aware of his presence. Thankful heart brings breakthrough, refines the focus of prayer. I've, I've, you know, to be honest, I feel like I'm, I live pretty thankful almost all the time, except when I'm flying. <laughs> that's, that's just a joke. I, I'm very thankful sitting in the air at 40,000 feet going, I'm just sitting up here really high off the ground. I'm thankful this plane is working. Yes. <laughs> I better stop. I... Thankful. But I, I can feel it in my heart, the need for the always. You know, when he says always, most of the time doesn't cut it. <laughs> 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 Can you imagine him saying, rejoice always? You know, just try. Just, if, if you get most of the time, you and I both know that's progress. <laughs> so Father, I do pray for just a heightened awareness of the privilege to live in the virtue of thankfulness. I thank you, God, that you've already impacted our city, church in our city with your presence, your purpose, your will. But I ask even more this week through thankful hearts in Jesus' name. I want to ask a question now before we uh, take off. <clears throat> I live more and more and more concerned for those who just simply do not have a personal relationship with Jesus. That's always been the case. But it, it's just right in front of me almost all the time now. And so I don't want to dismiss today until I give opportunity for anyone here who would say, Bill, I don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. I've not turned from my life to follow him. I don't know what it is to be forgiven of sin. I don't know what it's like to have God as my personal father. And yet you want that. If that's you, then I want you just to put a hand up in the air and I'll just make agreement with, with you where you are. Then you just say, Bill, I don't want to leave the building till I know I'm at peace with God, till I know I'm right with God. If there's anyone in, in the building that fits in that category, put your hand up, please. I want to give opportunity. Okay. Looks like we're all in. All right. Let me have ministry team come to the front. Tom, why don't you come up? If you could hold your places, please. It really helps us a lot uh, for this transition.